is about um, aggregation in general and um, this concept of aggregators, uh, both in a specific sense and in the general sense that Scalding and Summing Birth are both aggregators. I will talk today uh, about both Summing Bird and Scalding, what they are, what they're, a little bit about what their history was, and uh, how they fit together. Uh, I won't talk as much as uh, I want to thank Alexi for organizing this and also Travis for doing a lot of work uh, to, to get us all here tonight. I won't talk as much in the slides about the actual mechanics of how we use it at Twitter. Um, I'm happy to, I'll, I'll leave some time for you to ask some questions about it and I'll try to talk about that a little bit because I heard there was some interest about it. Um, but I can, I can give you a little bit of a spoiler alert that the fact is Twitter is pretty big now, and so I'm getting more and more myopic, and so I'm actually like surprised that people actually, I didn't know people ran this code. We just write it and uh, send it out to the ether, and like uh, apparently it occasionally is useful. So I'm Oscar Boykin, uh, Pasco, I'm at Twitter. Um, so first I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what Scalding is, uh, if you haven't heard of it before, and what the history of it was. Um, and um, I, I think it's interesting if you're starting a new project to, uh, to, to hear maybe what the history of Scalding was, because it wasn't very ambitious, honestly, uh, in some sense. So Avi Bryant, who's here, uh, uh, really hated working with Pig, okay? So, uh, so he's here at Twitter. He was acquired uh, from another company. Uh, they are forming the, the new analytics team at Twitter. And Pig was not expressive enough. It's a pain to write UDS. You have to uh, switch language. And the language is just kind of, it's, it's bad news, OK? So he was aware of this work. Uh, probably he can, he can talk more of it uh, about what he was aware of uh, other than just cascading. But there was this project called Cascading by Chris Wenzel. And it's, you know, it's like, you know, I, I don't know how, like, like, kid gloves I'm supposed to be. Like, so first of all, I don't like Scala as much as Alexi does. So, you know, it's just like democracy, you know, it just like, it just sucks less than most of the other options, okay? So like Java, like I don't like hate Java and love Scala, it's just that like Java is just much worse, okay? So this was like, who would want to program this way? There's a number of problems here, like there's like mutation going on all the time, like it's kind of a weird pattern, there are no types anywhere, the compiler can't tell you if your, your, your aggregation is correct at all, and then you go to run this job, and maybe it's gonna run for 10 hours, and then at the end, you're gonna get a cast class exception. And it's a total bummer, you know? So, like that, like that I, we didn't, I didn't like. Um, so it makes, you know, cascading though, it like, it works. You know, it works really well. So it has a pretty good optimizer, but like, I don't really wanna write code this way. And Avi didn't wanna write code this way either. So, so that's a pain. Not so great. We all know that you know Java can be verbose. I don't know if you've seen like <laughs> Fizzbuzz Enterprise Edition, but this is a real project. You can check it out on GitHub, and uh, you know it's like this is a disaster. You know, like this is not what you want to be doing. All I mean, you're at work a long time. You don't want to be coding this way. You know. So uh, Scala has a big fan base within Twitter, and I would say actually that that fan base has been growing. But slowly, actually, a lot of people maybe think that Twitter um, like really loves Scala in this way. But at the time that that Scalding started, um, there were a lot of factions within Twitter: people who really liked Ruby, people who really liked Java, and there were many people who liked Scala. Um, I would say that as time has gone on, we were doing less and less Ruby, almost no Ruby now, virtually no Ruby. Um, Java doesn't grow that is not growing as rapidly as Scala, so Scala is, is more and more becoming the dominant language at Twitter. I, I would say is, but, but you know we have a lot of Java. Okay. So I dug this up at one point in time. Here's the first commit to the, the repo that, that Scalding lived in. So it started on um, well this code at least. Avi can tell you more about it. It's kind of weird that I'm giving this like a little bit of history that Avi could just tell you. Like I, I this was two weeks before I showed up. Um, and there's some code, there's you know, a few hundred lines, and, and that's the sort of scalding. So what is scalding all about? So this is me and Argeris, the good old days, uh, back in ancient 2011. So we joined, we worked on scalding, and really quickly, one thing that was interesting is that we, like scalding initially really much, pretty much sucked, you know? It was like we needed to do some quick aggregations, and we did something that worked okay, and we wanted to use Scala because we could use our UDFs right in line. So if you're new to the Scala programming language, um, I don't know how much you're gonna enjoy my talk. I'll just try to like 
drink more and like maybe make a few more jokes. But if you use Scala a lot, like it's nice that you can use the UDFs directly in line and not have to switch to another language, not have to like write SQL and then write C code somewhere else. Um, you have one build system to maintain everything. So that was all really nice. Um, we got it working relatively quickly. So the first code was in May, and then we had a pretty good, yes? I'm going to UDF free bubble. Okay. I've asked people on both sides, and I don't know what it is. Oh, sorry. Uh, user defined function. So um, imagine, so if you're, if you're working with databases, like if you're, if you're used to SQL, maybe you think like the world, like you, you know, there's integers, and then there's like array. It's so weird. I mean, People work with SQL and they're like, what's wrong with SQL? And then it's like, what if I tell you in your programming language, you can only work with integers, strings, and like, a, yeah, I don't know, like, a, like floating point numbers. You'd be like, are you, are you fucking crazy? Like I, like, I can't get anything done with that. But some people like really accept that when it comes to analytics and aggregations. They, did, they weren't looking at it, in my view, critically enough at that point. The idea that you would want objects and aggregate objects rather than aggregating uh, just like numbers or strings or even tuples of numbers and strings, um, like at that time, like wasn't really that, that much done. It was like, you know, just use pig, it'll be fine. And it can just do these few type data types. So in pig, it's SQL-like, SQL-ish. It's not exactly SQL. It's not, it's not even that close to SQL, but it's SQL-ish. But if you want to change some function, like maybe you've heard about some cool approximation algorithm that is going to approximately tell you something that would have been very expensive to calculate otherwise, if you want to use that within PIG, you're going to have to drop into Java code or some other JVM language and write this code that, inter that implements a few of these interfaces that PIG sets out for you. And that's a total pain because you thought everything was cool and you had this text file and you could just run PIG on it. But then all of a sudden you have this huge impedance mismatch that as soon as you want to do something slightly custom, you've got to fire up an IDE and like have Java code gen and like Scala, you know, uh, sorry, you don't have to do Scala. Uh, the, the, the check styles, every, everything's going crazy. So it's a totally different workflow. Anyway, that's the UDF. Please interrupt me uh, with questions. So when we released this code, it wasn't like, like super great, but it like worked, it worked. It did what it like claimed to do. So some people like, like I think that that was really great. Like later I'll talk about Summingbird, which is like the other end where like perfectionism got the better of us and uh, we just like, like took way too long. So I can be really uh, uh, self-critical about like that whole process. So Scalding was working great. Everything was awesome. It started out as a DSL for cascading and then it evolved into a, a really, you know, I'm really happy with the API now. It's a very nice type safe uh, distributed collections API. So if you know Scala collections, you can pretty much take your knowledge of Scala collections and put them onto uh, Hadoop and, and, and process, you know, terabytes, you know, maybe exabytes of data. And uh, it's just, it's just going to work. You know, it's almost never, like, it's not going to out of memory. It's not always going to be the totally fastest thing in the world. If it compiles, it's almost certainly going to run. Uh, like, uh, it might not logically be what you want because, you know, it's, uh, you know, we don't have some perfect programming language that if it's compiled is correct. Uh, but it's, it's, it's pretty nice. It has a lot of optimizations, uh, a lot of the obvious things that you might think should be done, it knows about. Um, so at, at this state, it's really nice. So here's you know, just a sketch of what it looks like. And I'm really, this isn't really a, a scalding tutorial that will tell you much about scalding. There's plenty of resources like that on the web if you like. But, um, and even, uh, even this is like, We've added some like little polish that I think it makes it a little nicer. But here's the canonical word count example. So uh, you can write your 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 code inside of a, a class that subclasses job. You don't have to do that anymore. There's a really nice way to run Scalding as a library just at any point in your code and call some Scalding function and it'll go out to your Hadoop cluster and run. But a canonical example is to run it as a subclass of job. And uh, this is like this kind of very standard kind of Java programmers call this the fluent style, but in, it's not uncommon at all in Scala code to see this like dot chaining where you're taking one result and, and feeding on. And in this case, we're loading a text line, which is a source that represents some input data. Uh, we're applying flat map and flat map. If you're really, I don't know who's like super, who's like in the like Scala Z like camp of the super functional programmer. Like I like, I kind of like, you know, yeah. So if you're into that, like there's like three of us here, like I'm actually, I'm not in that camp. I'm very sympathetic to that camp, but I'll try to be like more Zen about life. So, um, <laughs> Uh, like flat map is not so. If you're into monads, flat map on the on and scalding is not 
the monadic mind, okay? So, um, and then the Scala Z people, like, we should have this debate. Sometimes they're like, what? That's some bullshit. But where does it say that in Scala, that flat map is the monadic mind? It actually doesn't. And, like, plenty of the Scala APIs violate that thing. Anyways, what, what flat map does in Scalding is what it does on, like, collections. So if I take one thing, I can map it to zero or more things. This kind of concept, if you're into the Scala Z world, it's Kleisley composition on, like, basically list or stream, okay? So that kind of operation composes really well. And it's a very common thing in analytics. So if you imagine that scalding is representing like a type table, so you have a, you know, we, they don't, it doesn't appear here, but we have a type that's called typed pipe. It's very similar to the RDD type in Spark. You can imagine each map operation or each flat map operation or filter is creating a new virtual table. But not all those tables will be materialized. That would be very wasteful. But one way that you can make a new table from an old table is line for line changing each row to another type of row, right? And that's what map does. And another way you can make one table into another table is to filter. You can say, I'll take not all of these rows, but, but some of them. But another concept that I think was really like not noticed before Scala got into the picture of, of, map, of map reduced with Hadoop is that like flat map is really what Hadoop is doing. So when they say map reduce, it's really flat map reduce. And what flat map, what that means is that with flat map, you could have implemented map. You could have implemented filter, but you can also implement something else, which is I can take one row and send it to five rows, or this other row is going to go to zero rows. So it's a more general concept. Um, it's very useful. Anyways, this is word count. So uh, I know like we shouldn't be, as a community, so down on word count, because actually, like most of what we do, really, I'm sure Lexi knows, like, when you're, you're, you're trying to be fancy, you've got your big data science title, but really, you're just counting shit. You know, like, that's all we're doing, you know? So, like, let's not be so down on word count. So in Scalding, um, there's, uh, like, like, this got on my nerves, so we actually cleaned that up a bit. We, we added a new thing called sum by key, but you've got your data. You say, let's go to the re reducers. That's the method called group. So at this point, notice we've got a key and a value. In this case, it's a word. So word count, we're going to take each item in our, in our sentence. Our key is going to be our word, and the value is just going to be the number one. We're going to group those, which means every row that has the same key is going to land up in the same bucket. And then we're going to sum. So every, every operation we do on a group, it looks like reduce operations. Reduce, if you're a Scala person, we've got fold left, we've got scan left, we've got um, head, we've got last, we've got min, we've got max, we've got like almost anything you can think of, or you can just plug your own thing in. You can give me a function that will take an iterator and return a new iterator, and you can do something totally general. But uh, this is like the obvious thing. And the, one of my favorite things you'll hear about later, I think, in Ian's talk, is sum is like totally general. Like, like we can sum sets together. How would you sum two sets together? Union. Totally knows that. How would you sum two maps together? Mer OK, how, so how would you merge? Yeah. Yeah, like for each key that's the same, we bring those together, and then we call, we merge, we do whatever sum would be on the values. And like this all works recursively. And if you're not down with type classes, like you should get down with type classes. I'm just going to, that's all I'm going to say. OK. So Alexi really wanted me to talk about the Twitter analytics stack. I'm going to do that. Here's the Twitter analytics stack. Actually, I'm going to totally lie. I'm only going to talk about, yes? I have a quick question about the previous slide. Yep. So you have a bunch of logic processing data in there. Yeah. And then there are two methods that seems to be operational. Like yeah. Forced to this. Yeah. So what's, yeah, what's going on with that? The answer is, like, I don't know, you make these slides and then you like copy and paste some like random like unit test, <laughs> which is what this was. And force to disk, uh, you would almost never, you, you almost never use that, but that's a method. It's an example of, there's a couple of things. So when you're working with a high level language, a lot of people will say, well, that sounds pretty good, but I don't really know how it's going to work. How is it going to run on my cluster? How can I control that? So there are a few things such as force to disk, force to reducers that will at least at that point, disable some of the optimizations that we're doing. So if you're saying, like, I know for a fact that this filter is going to filter out almost everything. I don't want you to combine it with the following flat map that might expand it back out. I want to go ahead and at that point, write, materialize it to disk. 
Users don't usually need to do this, but when you're really tuning and you're talking about jobs for Twitter, where it might be a 10 hour job in some cases, or in some cases more, the giving the user the ability to control the plan if they really need to is nice. Um, it's not a great example to put up here because it has too many concepts and it blurs like the simplicity away. Um, that's because I'm a shitty speaker. So. Okay, so, so what's up with the Twitter Scala analytics stack? So um, I think hearing Alex talk about it more, he was actually more interested in like the behind the scenes and how the bits actually move around. But I totally misunderstood that, and I'm going to tell you about our open source stack and how that all fits together. Um, so that's what we're going to do now. So Scalding, as I mentioned, that was the history. Where did Scalding come from? And it was our first Scala big data project, okay? So it's like Scala collections for Hadoop. And really happy with it. It works awesome. It is amazingly great. If you run with it, it's going to work for you. Full stop. Totally battle tested. We probably have 1,000 jobs in production. Totally works. Don't worry about it. It works. OK. Anyways, moving on from that. So Sam Ritchie and I uh, started working together. He was also here at Twitter. Um, and we looked at Scalding, and we, we started being interested in the problem of real-time streaming. So Scalding is totally Hadoop. It's, uh, I mean, you can run it locally not using Hadoop, but it doesn't really address the, like, uh, the, the, the um, Sparks uh, streaming case or Storm. So at that point in time, uh, Storm, uh, which is a project which you might be aware of, uh, was acquired uh, by the company Backtype, was acquired by Twitter. So Nathan Mars was here. And I was interested in Storm, but I was like, you know what? Those types are awesome. And Scala, while shitty, is much, much better than like having no types. So we should actually have a type safe way to program uh, Storm. So this was something that we really wanted to do. And after having done Scalding, we felt we, we could do this. So then, then we got total OCD and locked ourselves in like a hole for like a year and like polished and like over designed. Uh, but while we were doing this, various things came out. So the first thing that we, we, we produced was Chill, which was, is a serialization library. It has nothing to do with Scalding. You can use it elsewhere. People use it with Akka. They use it. Actually, um, Spark uses it. Uh, so it's a serialization library for JVM types. It serializes like almost any Scala type. Um, it's it's really nice. It's not type safe serialization, so it can so that's both good and bad. It can take any data that you hand at it, and it will do a usually a very very good job. And a lot of, all our data at Twitter goes through this uh, when they're passing data between mappers and reducers, and we almost never have a problem. Uh, very happy with it. Why am I hedging a little bit? Because it's not type safe, and I'm like sort of in the Scala Z camp, so I'm like, it gives me some anxieties. But all right. But actually, it doesn't cause a problem. So then there's Algebird. So that is like, so because I'm kind of in Scala Z camp, we had to have our own like algebra library. But actually, so Algebird was a library that we built to, act, to generalize aggregations. So we wanted to model aggregations in an algebraic way that was very nice that we could use from this new project that we were working on, which was called Summingbird. So we started to peel these things out. So that was really great. Algebird is amazing. You're going to hear more about that later. Uh, one of my colleagues, Ian, is going to talk about it. Now, the next thing, because we had all these OCD complex and we were like staying up late at night not sleeping about like type safety, we, we had this library bijection. And it turns out there are these couple of types, bijections and injections, that are really useful for serialization. So basically, an injection is, a bijection is a function, you have a pair of functions that go between two types. So you can go from T to U and U back to T, and it always works. And that's all a bijection is, and that's what this type gives you. But the nice thing about this is that they, if you're into the Scala Z, see, I'm not, not I'm like going off the deep end with it, they form a category. So you can glue these things together. They compose really well. If you have a bijection from A to B and a bijection from B to C, clearly you can glue the two together and get one from A to C, right? You can start drawing these diagrams. And an injection is almost the same thing, except you can always go from A to B, but B to C might fail. And that's serialization. If I have some data object like you know, a tweet record that has like an author and the text and like the timestamp, I can always turn that into bytes. But if you give me some random bytes, I can't always go back into a tweet record. Like some of them might just be like empty bytes, or there might be like only one byte and it's really not a valid record. So that's an injection. So we developed that library and that became very useful for us. Um, Ultimately, at the end of the day, we didn't force type safe serialization on everybody because it turned out they hated it. And so we stayed with Chill. 
Storehouse was a library that we built because we wanted to model, we, we were building this uh, summing bird, uh, which you'll hear about in a second. And summing bird was again our real time scalding, but we didn't want, like, like Hadoop has these output formats. So we needed to be able to, the real time output format is like a key value store. Like I need to be able to update something. But like, because we're just writing code, we don't really like to run it. Um, we just wanted some abstract trait that we could just jam in there and like some other person could go figure out how to actually do that. And that's what Storehouse was. It's like, you know, it's going to look like this and it can merge and do all these fancy things. And then a bunch of people implemented like Storehouse, HBase, Storehouse, uh, Redis, Storehouse, Memcache, Storehouse, Dynamo, DB. So we can easily plug in um, these kind of key value backends. And again, these things compose really well. So if I have two uh, key value stores that both have the same key type, I can glue them together that makes it look like one virtual um, key value store, and that's what Storehouse is all about. Basically, it's all about you know com composition combinators. We're just wasting our time and lives uh, making uh, combinators. So finally, when all this was 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 built up, we were ready to release uh, Summing Bird. And Summing Bird is a real time streaming version of uh, Scalding uh, with a really nice way to make sure you don't screw things up when you're running in real time. So it's, it's, it's extremely nice. Now, that having been said, Avi Bryant made the following tweet, which I thought was kind of amazingly uh, accurate, which is that it's kind of uh, the apex predator of the data infrastructure world. Like the, the existence of it like, is evidence of this thriving ecosystem underneath. So it does all these great things for you, but the problem is it like does a lot of things. So like at Twitter, it's like cool because we have the memcache team and the storage team and this the storm team, and like they're going to manage all this infrastructure for you. Uh, when you're at a smaller company and you have to you you see how many pieces you have to be running to to run a real lambda architecture system, which I'll describe in a second. It's actually a little bit challenging. So Summingbird is a Lambda architecture system. It's an idea that Nathan Mars was very excited about. And he came to Twitter, and I heard about it, and I wanted to make it more formal. So uh, I, I thought that he was kind of vague about it. And I uh, worked with Sam to make it very precise using this algebraic library that we had, this algebra library. But what, what it allows you to do is Summingbird, you can write these real-time jobs that run both online in Storm and offline they can use Scalding or Hadoop. And so you can write the job one time, literally, like no, no joke, and like take that same function and render a job that can run in many different platforms. We've had like Spark platforms that we've implemented. Like we don't run Spark in production very much. We just play around with it right now. So we haven't like pushed that too much, but you can find that on our GitHub project. Um, we had an ACA backend. Um, you know, there, there have been some other ideas. There's like two in memory ones, one that uses like uh, Fut Scala features, one that just like runs in one thread. So it's relatively easy to write a planner. But the way our data, our, our real time, to, to Alexi's question earlier, we have these services and they're running and they're serving all the tweets. And you're making a tweet and you're talking to the service. And as an afterthought, there's this exhaust of these services. And these, this exhaust goes and gets pushed onto Kafka queues. So we use thrift a lot here. So the request comes in, I've got a thrift object. The response goes out, I've got a thrift object. Just jam both of them onto the wire and it's on a queue somewhere. And now as far as the service is concerned, it's done with life. And now analytics load can begin. So we take that queue, put it onto HDFS every hour. Here's another file, got another uh, chunk. But also, we can consume that queue in real time from, we use Storm here. And so uh, we have these, we just pull off the Kafka queue, we take another data record and start pushing it through these, these analytics topologies that we have that are really just these big scalding like functions. Now, what's the Lambda architecture have to do? So it's really hard to make a transactional real-time system. I don't know if you tried to do that. So you have data duplication, you have data loss. It's extremely hard to deal with. But you also don't want to like totally give up the idea of correctness. So with the Lambda architecture, the idea is, is that you try to do something fast, you have the speed layer, and then you have this transactional like batch layer that's slower, and then you like somehow merge them together. Now that's like Sounds kind of hard. Like, how do you do that in general? So what Summing Bird allows you to do is it constrains the rules more. But if you follow those rules, it will merge them together for you, and it will get it right. So then the way that works is that the online portion is going to keep track of like things in like time in, in like little bounded buckets. 
And one bucket will not talk to the next bucket. And you control how big those buckets are. If one of those buckets gets corrupted, it's fine because we're going to come back and replace the total correct data record up to that bucket, up to and including that bucket offline. And then we have a way using Algebra and Storehouse to combine the most recent bucket with the last transactionally correct bucket offline. And you don't have to worry about that. So that's been a pretty big win. We deploy it, works well. So what it means is when things go down and we lose a little bit of the speed layer, it's OK. Um, like in an hour or two, we're going to fix it back up. As far as your question, like how does this affect uh, Twitter, right now only a few properties, that only a few things that you can see from Twitter.com would be affected by the analytics pipeline. So we're starting to roll out. You might have seen some TechCrunch articles, like some stats that, that are related to um, aggregations on uh, metrics around your tweets. Uh, there's also uh, a product that Ian will talk about a little bit about seeing which news articles pointed to a tweet. These are aggregations that are done with Summingbird. But a lot of the aggregations with Summingbird are generally powering either feature detection for uh, machine learning. So we're building, all, we're, we're doing word count over and over again. We're counting all the things, and then we're feeding that into a logistic regression that might be ranking like Discover or who to follow or ads. So that's more of what it, or it might be awareness for us, just situational awareness of what's going on with Twitter. So. Um, so, something where it's confusing on a number of levels. It has this, like, it forces you into this one way of thinking, like, aggregations have to be, like, algebraic. Um, it's this portable MapReduce, streaming MapReduce model, so you could be like, oh, I don't really care about Lambda architectures, but wait a second, I can write one bit of code and run it on Spark and Hadoop and, and Storm. And also, it's that whole Lambda architecture thing. So I think it has a little bit of this, like, a, it's like a, it's a hard sales thing to explain. So I'm just kind of like telling you my, I'm lamenting here that it's hard to sell uh, outside of Twitter. Inside of Twitter, it's been great. But uh, obvious tweet pretty much describes the situation. So yeah. this N means like there is hard, it's hard to come, come up with what's after the N in the title? Uh, what, what? It says, somewhere is portability N. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I guess that, 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 that Slide got messed up. So it's like a portability layer and this like uh, and the uh, lambda architecture implementation. So that's what it should be. So a lot of people say I don't need a lambda architecture implementation, therefore I don't need your summing bird thing. Or, or other people say like actually I would love to be able to write my code once and run it on Hadoop and 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 Scalding like that. Or sorry, and uh, uh, Storm and, and Hadoop. And so like, but I don't know if I need so. I don't know. When, when a project doesn't do one thing, it's kind of a hard thing to, to explain to people, I've found. Yes? So we're speaking about real time in terms of summing word and Twitter. What's the actual window we are talking about? Is it? So that's a, that's a good question. A lot of people. Yeah, so, so, yeah, it's a good question. What do you mean by real time? So one thing, summing bird different than, like, like, compared to other systems that talk about uh, streaming, like, so Summingbird is strictly streaming, meaning that each data record gets pushed all, can, you could in principle push it all the way through the topology before you process the next record, in principle. So some things get really confusing. I'm going to have this rolling batch window. Uh, this batch window is going to do these little things. There's no notion of this in Summingbird. So it's extremely restricted for that. So it's like you can only push through one thing at a time. At first, so here's the problem. You, you talk to systems people, they're like, let me give you anything you want. You want a window? Sure, I'll give you a window. What else do you want? They're going to keep trying to give you what you want. But I think there's a real power in constraining the model. Like, we, we don't give you the window. But because we don't give you the window, there's a huge amount of optimizations that we can do. And we can schedule this, these topologies on Hadoop and Storm and make them consistent between the two. And we found that it's not really a barrier. People say they want a window. Generally, there's another algorithm that doesn't need the window, and we, we get by it. And it's, it's very scalable as a, as a result of that. Your next question that you might have hinted at was, what's the time between the, the, log, the log event being written to the Kafka queue and it changing some, say, memcache store? That depends on, because this, uh, because Summingbird has a lot of optimization options, you can choose how much caching you're going to do in the inner, so we don't require, like logically there is, there is no batching, but for caching, you might enable some of it along the way. 
So your algorithm doesn't rely on the batching, but we might be doing some caching and batching and like, like pre-aggregations. So the more aggregation, pre-aggregation you do and the larger caches you enable, the more your, it's a latency throughput trade-off. So you lower your, through, the, you, you raise the throughput of data you can handle at the expense of greater latency. So different people are operating at different points on that curve. So I would say the average job maybe is like on, you know, seconds, and some of them might be 10 seconds delayed. Yeah. Yeah. Who, who has the knobs for tuning that? Is it the operation guys or is it the application guys? It's a little bit of, I mean, it's both. So the application, people can tune it. Like I would say actually right now, there may be too many knobs. And one of our goals is to make it more self-tuning. But also our, our, our operations people and our SREs can look at the jobs and make recommendations and, and redeploy them relatively, relatively easily. OK. So part two, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm running out of, wait, what's, what's my time looking like? OK. A lot of time. You guys are like, oh, fuck, man. He didn't just say, like, just like, calm it down. OK. So let me talk, so I'll talk, I'll show you one example of what scalding really looks like. Actually, like, let's do the sexy stuff. Let's not do that. So here's a job that, like, if you, so now, so that was something we were in scalding, history, like, what our stack looks like. Now we use it a lot. I'm going to show you one example before I go on to, like, uh, the last part of the talk. So uh, clustering. So you have a bunch of books. You want to find out some similar books to each other based on the text corpus. Or you have a bunch of tweets and, or, or users, and they each have some following graph. And you want to look at similar users based on their following. Okay? So this is a very, very common problem. You can use it in ad targeting. You can use it in recommendations. You can just use it in social science. Maybe you're just interested. So here's how this might look in a reasonably idiomatic and nice scalding job. I, I would say reasonably because usually when we're into Scala, we like to avoid some of the type hints. And Argyris, who wrote this, uh, put in more of the type hints uh, so it's less confusing. But uh, I, don't, I don't know. I'm into the confusing thing. So, so this job is going to read some input data. And that input data is going to, I guess in this case, it's a, as you can see, it's a TSV that has in the first column a string, in the next column a long. Okay. So you see, he, as he maps, he's going to name what those things are. So first, he's going to map them over. So he's got his first table. It's a, it's a simple, like, think of it as an SQL table with two columns. And he's going to map it onto a new, new table. And that mapping is, the first column is, he's calling it uh, item ID. Uh, so that string, in this case, I guess, is like the ID. Let's imagine it's a user, it's an it's a, uh, Amazon product ID. Or it might be uh, a, a, a Twitter handle, like you're following, you know, user, you know, X. And then there's user ID, which in this case is represented as a long. So here's a user that has an edge to some product, okay, or some item. Now we're going to use this fancy algebra stuff uh, that Avi was excited about this algorithm from the surely from probably for, for a long time. But I remember when I interviewed with, with Twitter almost, I, I remember him talking about this algorithm. So he's always been interested in minhash as an algorithm for approximate similarity. So uh, you take this minhasher, and what minhasher is going to do is gonna, it's going to represent, like it's going to create from your item like a signature that is not a full representation of the data, but it's like an approximate set, if you will. It's sort of like an approximate set. And this approximate set will tell you, like sets can tell you a lot of things exactly. They can tell you how many members are in your set. They can tell you if a particular item is in your set. But they can also tell you an intersection or a union size. And what, what minhash tells you is the ratio, approximately, of the intersection of two sets and their union. Sometimes this, this ratio is called the Jacquard similarity. So if we have two sets that have nothing in common, their intersection is 0, their union is non-zero, therefore their Jacquard similarity is 0. Uh, if you have two sets that are identical, their intersection is the whole set. The union is the same whole set, so their Jacquard similarity is 1. So this is a number that goes between 0 and 1. And when it goes to 1, it's more similar. So a minhash object, this minhash signature, is like an approximate set, but it can only answer really one question for you, and that's that, that Jacquard similarity. So in Algebra, we have this. No need to write this fancy algorithm. You can like go get your promotion and tell everybody how you're a big fancy machine learner just by import algebra.minhash. You're good to go. Okay? Uh, you group it up. You sum them together. Remember when I was talking about how like, Scalding just know if you add things together, what should that mean? right? 
and it, it means the correct thing. So it does that with like, if you know your Scala, you got your implicit type classes going on, boom, it just works. So we add up all these min hash signatures for all these items. So now each item has a, like this min hash signature associated with it, okay? And it's like a union, if you will. So again, with set, adding two sets together, we said that was union. And remember, I said min hash signature is like an approximate set, right? So it's an approximate union. It's a, it's a union on this approximate set. That's what sum is here. Now, what we're going to do is uh, this min hash idea, it, it has this notion of like you can get these signatures out. So like, that's a technical detail of the algorithm that I don't really have time to go into. Uh, but anyway, the idea is like it can give you some signatures that are IDs that would be similar to it. It's like if you have a hash code. I'm sure you're all familiar with a hash table. If to put something into a hash table, you have to have the hash code. What if I give you an algorithm that gives you like five hash codes? And I'm going to put you into five buckets, and with high probability, anyone you're similar to would be in those buckets. Very high probability. And you can tune the number of buckets to increase that probability. So the min hash algorithm does that. I don't want to like, go into detail on this too much. But after we create these buckets and the indices like for each of these hashes, we again just add them all up. Uh, and now what we've got on the value is the set of strings and the min hash signatures that went into the, each of these buckets. So finally, we've got, we're just going to expand all these things out. Once we've got them together, we've got the, uh, the bucket ID and the index that went in. But actually, this code disregards it. I'm not really sure why our gears chose to write it that way. But we have this pair, this set of strings and min hash signatures that landed up in those buckets. So we have a bunch of buckets, and in those buckets, we've got little bags of like, here's a bunch of approximate sets and the names associated with them. And now all we do is we do the brute force check for all the items in those little hashed buckets. Like, they should be similar. If they're, if they're similar, they'd be, in, they'd be co-located into a hash bucket. And all we do is, for each of those hash buckets, look at all pairs. So get everything out for the A, for B, Let's just brute force and see what the similarity is. Now, this is approximate similarity because, remember, that's what the min hash does. It gives you an approximate Jacquard similarity, like approximate set union, approximate intersection. That's what's going on. Um, and if that similarity is good and you're not similar to yourself, emit it. And this is like the real deal. Like you can actually run this in like one page of code, and you've got like a pretty good like, like search now of related items just on an input graph. Generic input graph, really. Super nice. That's what Scalding is all about. Boom. So um, you're going to hear more about algebra, but that's what enables a lot of this. And this min hash gives us this approximate set similarity. So Ian's going to tell you about hyperlog log and count min sketch, which can do even more fancy stuff like that. Um, all ready to go. The last thing that I really wanted to talk about was this, because like, like, like I like to make fun of the Scala Z people, but only because I envy them, because they get to live in this pure functional world that's so beautiful. And so uh, this is what I'm excited to tell, talk to you about. So when all this is going on, it's like, man, there's a lot of patterns here. And every time you see a pattern, that, like if you repeat yourself, you start to like, like, wait a second, I'm missing something. I'm not understanding it. I should be able to find some unifying concept and not do it all over and over again. And so I'm going to tell you about a pattern that we noticed super early. And then Avi named it. Uh, and we put it in algebra, and it just kind of sat dormant for a while. And obviously, I take the honestly, I take the blame. Like I was like, yeah, it's okay, it's usable, it's not that great. But then recently, somehow we noticed, like, man, I've really been missing the boat here. And this is an amazing, beautiful abstraction. So I want you to walk away with nothing else than Scalding is the most amazing software ever written, and you should really try something, Bird. If you take nothing else away from my talk, take away this idea that there's this concept called an aggregator, which I'm going to tell you about, which will work for you regardless if you're using. Summing bird, scalding, spark, in local memory, just talking to people at the blackboard because you don't run code, you just write it. So let's suppose you're faced with the problem of getting the size of this list. Here's a linked list. It's got seven cells, it looks like, and I just chose some totally meaningless numbers. Okay? Now, uh, the way that we would do this in MapReduce is we would map, I want to get the size, right? So I map each of these items over to the number one. So I throw away what's in the, the list. I've got the number one, so that's map x to one. And then I say reduce by applying 
you know, just take a pair and add them together. So the awesome thing about reduction, right, is that it enables a huge amount of parallelism because the contract of this reduced function should be that it's an associative function. That means I could be doing this pair while I'm doing this pair while I'm doing this pair. And the, late, the depth of this tree becomes log of the number of things that I'm aggregating. So great, I've got the size. So I got two here, then I got some other node got two here and two here. And we combine them, we've got the length of this tree is seven. Great. So what if I, rather than map reduce as two separate ideas, and I, like I said, we're assuming our reduced functions are associative in this way. Uh, I feel like I talk about associative functions by now, like even like my mom's got like a really good handle on it. So I don't know if I should really be saying it anymore, but like, there it is. Okay. They're, they're called semigroups also. So just, I don't know if you hear the word semigroup, it just means that there's an associative function. So rather than map reduce, what we really want is like a, an object that talks about map and semigroup in one abstraction. And maybe that's what we mean by an aggregator. But let's imagine we, instead of wanted the size, we wanted the average of these things. So to get the average of this list, we might do it this way. To get the average, we need both the count and the total sum. So we need to do two aggregations at the same time. But then finally, we need to do something with them. So we could do it this way. Again, map is we, we can map each x onto the tuple of 1 comma x. So now I've done that here. 1 is the count, and x is the value. And now, because the natural sum, they just remember how we just like know like the, the sum of a tuple would be the pointwise sums, just like we all just intuitively know the right way to do things. Um, so we would reduce the, the natural way. By the way, uh, Algebra knows how to do this. So if you have nested tuples of tuples of, algebra, of maps of sets of tuples of whatever, and just like call semigroup plus, it would just magically add all that together. It's pretty awesome. Um, so doing this whole tree, we get down to the bottom, and now the count is 7, but the sum is 58. Okay, So I want to know the average of all the, the first seven prime numbers. right? So that's what this problem is. What's the average of the first seven prime numbers? So I had map and reduce, but I'm not done yet. So what I really need is another map function that will take 7 and 58 and divide 58 by 7. right? So that's what I've got up on the board with our awesome Scala programming language. So what I really want is map, semigroup, and a map. And if I had an ob object like this, I could really like throw it, like use it as a hammer on all kinds of things. I could make my like minhash thing that we talked about earlier an aggregator that would do that whole, would do almost that whole algorithm and just hit it on like lists locally in memory. I could go hit it on Spark. People have definitely done this. I could run it natively in Scalding. I could run it on Summingbird. And that's what we have. We have this type, which we call aggregator. And it looks like this. It's a trait. It's very simple. It's got three types. So uh, it has the, the name prepare. So that's where I'm getting it ready for aggregation. That's preparing phase. Then I have a semigroup that's going to be this associative operation to combine those middle types. So that's the reduction that was going on. And then finally, when I've reduced it down, I need to present it to you in some nice way. There means the post-processing. Sometimes the presenting is like identity. Like in the first example of computing the sum, the presenting was like, I'll just give you the number. Why don't I just tell you the value? Um, but uh, in, the, in the second to last example, it was this division. So it's not like they're all that tricky. But so what's so cool, by the way, you can get that amazing four line trait uh, at uh, Twitter slash algebra on GitHub. Actually, it's a, a lot more than that, but that's the core that needs to be done. The interesting thing was that this idea was in Scalding right at the beginning. We noticed that this map reduce map of having maps, map reduce, and map. And actually, I think Alexi might have organized this um, talk back at Foursquare's old office, like in 2000, like one of the first talks about Scalding ever. And this is actually a slide from that. And I made this joke, and Josh Wills was there. I'm like, that's how Twitter's totally killing it. It's not map reduce, it's map reduce map. Uh, we can maybe find that somewhere. And it was, uh, it, was, it, was, it was funny at the time. But actually, the cool thing was that these aggregators compose really well. So you remember, like, if you watched, like, The Graduate, and the guy's like, you know, the future is like plastics, you know? 
Like, I, like, like, the, the, like, like with programming, I'm telling you, like the future is combinators, you know? Like if your shit does not combine, like, you know, you just like, or what is it, like uh, Dan Rosen, uh, Travis, do you, like does not compose is the new, is a piece of shit. Um, I, I, I think that's another thing. So like aggregators compose, you know, they're awesome. So I'll tell you about three ways they compose. The first way is the end then present. Sorry about the names. We debated like these names. You could have said like, this could be called map. Um, and the, the uh, but it's like a little like maybe too esoteric. But like I'm going to do this aggregator, and then I'm going to do more presenting on the end. So if you give me a function from the out type to a new out type, I can take an old aggregator and turn it into a new aggregator that returns an out too. That's very common. I want to change the type. Maybe you I'm going to return a long to you, but actually you wanted a big int, or actually you're going to print it out to the user, so you need to convert it to a string. So these are the kinds of, that's one like pretty obvious way to compose. So they compose in that nice way. There's another one. This one for the Scholar Z crowd is you might call this contramap because it's also a contrafunctor. Oh. <laughs> so uh, you've got your n2 into n, and I can take a fun an aggregator that went from n middle to out and convert that into n2 to middle to out. And it's pretty obvious how I do it. I first like prepare it a different way, and then I keep preparing it, right? So that's way that you can compose it too. Now here's the really fancy, amazingly badass way that we really didn't respect enough early on, and this is what got me so excited. Um, like when I realized, man, we were totally underusing this. You can take two aggregators that maybe both go over like integers, one is going to tell you the maximum value. One is going to tell you the minimum value. But I don't want to have to go through my list twice or my, my big data iterator twice. I want to join them together and only go through once. And aggregators can be joined. So if I have an aggregator of type that starts with type n and another one that starts with type n, I can glue them together into one that starts with type n but has then forks out in the middle. So this join com composition is extremely powerful. Um, I'm sure you can like think of examples of it. I'm heard. I'm sure you've heard of the monad, right? And so monads are extremely popular. I think people. The next monad is the applicative functor. So right under the monad, there's another type called applicative functor. And what applicatives allow you to do is glue things together in this way. If you have a list of type int and a list of type string, you can glue them together in some way to make a list of type int comma string. Like you can think of a lot of examples of that kind of gluing together that makes this to, that, that takes that type into this, this pair. And it turns out aggregators are applicative functors. They're not monads, but they're applicative functors. You don't, you can hear that name and like, like, I don't know, like they could be like, you know, foo bars or like bobs. And some people hear those words and they get turned off. I think we should just be like, you know, like, like doing the robot and like saying like, they're applicative functors. And then like, we could like just laugh at how absurd it sounds and maybe we won't be intimidated by it. I think that's a better way to, uh, to, to but, I, but I think that's pretty freaking cool. So this allows us to do two aggregations with one pass over the data. So how does that become awesome? And check this out. We made this awesome page for you, which you can go see on our wiki. So what does it look like now? Suppose you've got some SQL up there and what you want to do is you want to select the customer name and the maximum of the order quantity from your order table, and you want to group by the customer name, right? With aggregators, you can make a lot of scalding code look quite a lot like SQL aggregations. So you define what your aggregator is going to be here. So first, we're going to import the max by aggregator. And we have this case class that represents this table, which I excluded on this, on this slide. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the max of the case class by its order quantity, like the row. We're going to take the maximum by. That's just like that line up on the upper right. And then actually, we're just going to select the order quantity. We're going to throw out the rest of the row. That's a, a little bit of a weird way to write it, but OK. And now the scalding code looks like from the orders, group by the customer name. That was the last line we had up there. Apply our aggregator. And that's what it's going to print out. And this is exactly like what you would expect the SQL to do. So these aggregators are super nice. There's an aggregate method in Scalding on, on whole tables. You can aggregate them all the way down, or you can group by an aggregate. And there's a ton of examples right here. You can search Scalding aggregator and see a lot of great examples to see the power of this composition. And keep in mind, you can use these aggregators 
for the low, low price. No. Um, you can use these aggregators on lists, on Scala vectors. You can use them in Spark. You will find people who are using it in Spark. It is not tied in any way. Algebra has no significant dependencies. There's one like bit set dependency. So it has virtually no dependencies. You can use it anywhere with no problems. So that's the story. That's all I got. Scalding kind of kicked off our Scala data, uh, big data platform at, at Twitter. Before Scalding, there was not, sorry, Scalding did. Before Scalding, we didn't really have any Scala big data tools. Um, and Summingbird was our kind of real time project there. Uh, it's really great, really happy with it, a lot more machinery. And I want you to take away, if nothing else, that aggregators are an incredibly powerful concept. You can go implement them yourself if you don't like our implementation. Um, in Haskell, they're called fold.m, it turns out. We found that out. Like, it's like, it's not, it, you know, all these ideas are not new, I guess. Um, and Algebraird, if you're using Scala, has a ton of awesome aggregators, you're gonna hear about some later, to do probabilistic data structures, maximum min, histograms, moments, averages, set union, list concatenation, vector pointwise addition, map merge, you name it, it's all there. Okay, so that's all I got. Thank you very much. Questions. Is that Adam? Hey, how's What's up? Uh, hey, I, I remember talking to you a while back. You were interested in uh, Spire. And yes. I, I was just double checking that you had been involved with that uh, before I asked the question. I noticed you had merged a couple of pull requests a couple of hours ago. Can you talk about um, where you see that going and how that might work with, with Algebra down the road? Yeah, okay. That's a good question. Um, I don't know if I should also speak into that microphone or not. So the question was, and I, I'll say, I, are we using, is this only local? Or does it matter? I'm going to okay. try to find another one. Okay. Um, so the question was, so Algebraird is this algebra library for, uh, like it's really focused on algebra. Um, it, Scala Z is really fun focused on functional programming. There's a little, a few overlaps between Scala Z and Algebraird, not that much. Spire, there's a lot more overlap between um, Spire and Algebra. Spire is uh, another algebra library for Scala. What, like Eric, awesome dude, one of the main people, Eric and, um, was it, uh, is it Thomas? Yeah, like, like both superb uh, people, two of the greatest members of the Scala community, if you ask me. Uh, they did some amazing work on Spire. Spire is a really beautiful project. The difference between Spire and Algebra, Algebra is really focused on, um, taking algebraic abstractions for like big data or approximation algorithms and putting them into this algebraic framework that we talked about, semi-group. There's other ones, group, monoid, you might have heard of some of them, ring, field, if you're into the math. Um, and all those concepts, they're in math, so they're there in Spire as well. But Spire is really more perform uh, focused on high performance um, math and Scala, but also modeling it in a rigorous way. So it was a kind of a shame that these two things existed and they didn't like work together that well. So Eric and I and Avi um, and Thomas, about a year ago, I think it was, um, said wouldn't it be cool if we had a project underneath Spire and Algebraird, which we just like, like, why not just call it Algebra? It's the Algebra package. So yes, there's this project called Algebra. So just totally like owning that, uh, like nobody gonna have an algebra package anymore, like, like that's ours now. Um, and the goal is to take all of the modeling of abstract algebra that exists in Algebra and in, in Spire and to agree on the type classes and then we will make Spire and Algebra extend these common type classes. So you could write generic code that takes an algebra semigroup and you could use your Spire with it or your Algebra, algebra with it, totally fine. So our, we're very close to getting there. We've maybe uh, gone off the rails a little bit, adding lattice and band and all sorts of mathematical things and debating like what we should call a semi-ring or versus a rig. Um, but we're very close to like full agreement. And when that's there, I would expect in the next like three months at the most, both Spire and Algebra will depend on these traits, and so we can kind of start to share more code. So that's that story. You can find it on GitHub, GitHub non slash um, Algebra. Algebra, not bird. By the way, when, when we said Algebra Bird, we thought it was so stupid, like a ridiculously, like it was, it was a, it was a self-deprecating name of like how Twitter always names things after birds, and it was like, a, like an asinine name. And like, it's so sad when like an asinine name like that ceases to sound asinine to me anymore. I'm just like, yeah, Algebra Bird, that's like normal. That's fine. <laughs> One more question. 
prosper. Um, how do you deal in real time with data that requires kind of like, oh, uh, let's say, for example, that like, you can count the number of clicks on a tweet, but how do you count the number of like, unique uh, users who have seen a tweet in real time? Well, that's a perfect question for my colleague Ian to answer. He's going to spend a lot of time talking about that problem on how we would do that within this framework, so I don't want to steal any of his thunder. So I'm just going to leave that to him. And I guess that's our last question. So I'm going to step aside, or do you want to? Um, we might have some more time for questions afterwards, but I think we Sure. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Oscar.